Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to the SBI Health Matters. This is the second webinar in our Health Matters series this year. And um, we're absolutely delighted that so many of you are so interested in type 1 diabetes and have decided to join us, uh, which should be a very stimulating afternoon. Uh, look, my name is Karen Inge. I'm chair of the SVI Foundation, and I will be your MC for today. But before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we find ourselves today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples participating in this webinar today. And as my granddaughter told me uh, yesterday at her kindergarten, they're, all, we're, they're also encouraged to say thank you for the beautiful birds, the flowers, the trees and the land that we share with you today. So today's program is going to be very interesting. And um, it's, we're going to have a presentation from two of our amazing SVI researchers. Uh, firstly, Dr. Michelle So, um, who will be talking about the steps towards preventing type one diabetes when possibility becomes reality followed by a short overview of the current type 1 diabetes research being conducted at SVI from Professor Helen Thomas. Um, after the presentations, uh, we will have a, a short Q&A where you will have the opportunity to write questions to Michelle um, and Helen. And um, as you all know by now that there is a Q&A button on the bar at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to type your questions uh, throughout the webinar and we will only be using that Q&A feature today rather than the chat or the raise hand options. Uh, so we will try, um, last time we had so many questions, we couldn't get through them all during the session, but uh, we promised to get back to you uh, after the session. Uh, so that's extra work for Michelle and Helen, but they certainly don't mind. So we'll, we'll be very happy to answer all of your questions. Hopefully we can. So. Let me introduce to you our first speaker, who is uh, Dr. Michelle So. Now, um, Michelle is an endocrinologist. She obtained her PhD here at SBI in 2018, investigating the targets of immune cells in type one diabetes. She recently completed some postdoc research at the Benaroya Research Institute in Seattle in the US. And, um, the BRI is one of the world's leading research institutions uh, focusing on immunology and um, uh, finding out cures and, and et cetera for uh, diseases of the immune system. So like SBI, it's a world-class research institute. And she was involved in translating uh, basic science into clinical trials, aiming to prevent type one diabetes. So um, without further ado, it's the, the virtual floor is yours, Michelle. Excited to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for the introduction. I'll just share my screen now. Okay. I'm guessing everyone can see that okay. Um, so it's my pleasure to share with everyone on this uh, virtual platform the basic principles of the efforts towards preventing type 1 diabetes and one of the recent breakthrough discoveries. So just as a disclaimer, I'd just like to say that none of the photos I've used today include people with type 1 diabetes. They're just models used for illustrative purposes. So to lay, the to lay down the foundation, I'll just start with where we were. Uh, one of the key breakthroughs, and then where we are now headed in the area of research uh, in type 1 diabetes prevention. So starting with where we were. So for those of you who have been diagnosed or have children diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, you probably remember clearly that moment you heard the words, you or your child has type 1 diabetes. And so often as the treating doctor, I hear patients quick to blame themselves for the diagnosis and ask what they did wrong. Now, for those of you with the diagnosis, these basics of type 1 diabetes are familiar to you. But for those of you for whom type 1 diabetes is not something you live with, type 1 is a disease that affects the insulin-producing beta cells of the pancreas. 
And insulin is key to ensuring the sugar or glucose from the bloodstream gets to where it's needed in the body. The cells of the immune system, a key one being the T cells, are critical for protecting us against foreign organisms and infections. And so um, the, sorry, um, in type 1 diabetes, T cells attacks the beta cells as if they are foreign. So I'm always very keen to make clear from the start that type 1 diabetes is a disease of the immune system gone wrong. And so like all autoimmune diseases, there is nothing the person with the disease did to cause it. Another common question I get asked is if the beta cells can recover and the insulin treatment stop. To answer this question, it's often important for people to understand when the disease process actually started. So at birth, we all have many islets full of healthy insulin producing beta cells as represented by these circles here. It is understood, however, that many years before diagnosis, the T cells that attack the beta cells already start to invade the pancreas. And so a period of time before diagnosis, we know that many of those beta cells actually have already stopped functioning as the immune system continues to attack the beta cells. So by the time someone presents with type 1 diabetes and is diagnosed, there are around 20% or less of functioning beta cells remaining in the pancreas. And so that's why we don't see the beta cells recover and people being able to stop insulin after diagnosis, because the disease didn't start when the symptoms started. The disease started years prior. And at the point of diagnosis, the damage is largely already done. A natural follow-on question would then be, could we have known about this earlier? Currently, we have no way to look into the pancreas and see what immune activity is happening. No scans can pick this up. The only window we currently have into the pancreas is through a blood test. But there are too few circulating islet attacking T cells to detect easily on a blood test. However, another key cell in the immune system is the B cell, and they are important in directing T cells to where they are needed. In someone with type 1 diabetes, the B cells also act inappropriately and send wrong messages that direct the T cells to the islets. And we can detect evidence of these messages in the bloodstream. Now, these messages are known as autoantibodies. And there are four autoantibodies that are associated with type 1 diabetes that we currently test clinically. 95% of children who develop type 1 diabetes before puberty will have detectable autoantibodies by the age of five. Antibodies can reliably be detected on a blood test. And so after many long-term studies, it's now understood that the more different islet autoantibodies detected in a person, the greater the likelihood they will develop clinical disease. In fact, after studying thousands of people, um, it's now appreciated that if you have two or more autoantibodies, even before you have any symptoms, your lifetime risk of getting clinical diabetes is essentially 100%. So this has led to what we call a staging system for type 1 diabetes. So previously, diabetes was, as mentioned earlier, um, something diagnosed when only about 20% of the beta cells are functioning. So I like to think of it as a candle with only a small portion of the candlestick left where the candlestick represents the amount of beta cells remaining and the flame is the active immune system. This is now what we would call stage three type one diabetes. Pre-stage one is anyone who has a genetic risk of type one diabetes. So that's determined by family history. So anyone with the family history of type one diabetes has a 15 times increased risk of getting type one diabetes or a particular genetic test. Stage one, is when, if you like, the candlestick is at its peak. And so you have full amount of beta cell functioning, but the flame is lit. Uh, and so the autoimmunity has begun as we would detect by having two or more autoantibodies. Stage two is someone who has lost some of their beta cell function as can be seen with the melted candlestick and has abnormal glucose readings, but not at the level where they would be diagnosed with diabetes. And as mentioned, stage three is at the traditional point of diagnosis and stage four is what we consider long-standing diabetes. And as you can see, represented by essentially most of the beta cells are no longer functioning. 
And so once the candle is lit, as represented here, uh, with two or more um, order antibodies as would, uh, as would be detected by a blood test, that is the start of what we would consider an inevitable decline to clinical diabetes. And up until recently, there have been no way to prevent uh, the ongoing loss of beta cells. And so there was really no benefit from knowing earlier. And so could we have known about the disease earlier? Well, the answer is yes, but there was nothing we could have done to change the course of the disease. In fact, there were many attempts of preventing stage three type one diabetes by using different forms of insulin, reducing the exposure to cow's milk protein, but none of them were successful. However, there were other studies going on that were conducted in people who were just diagnosed. So remember, although a lot of their beta cells have been destroyed, there's still a portion remaining. There have been a lot of studies showing that retaining this small portion of beta cells can reduce complications like eye disease, reduce severe low glucose events. And those people who survive over 50 years with type 1 diabetes were often found to have these small portions of insulin producing beta cells left in their pancreas. And so there have been to date um, about seven immune therapies that have successfully been able to delay the loss of those small portions of functioning beta cells in people already diagnosed with clinical type 1 diabetes or stage 3 type 1 diabetes. So from 2002 to the most recent being just last, oh, just this year, sorry. And what you don't necessarily appreciate from the timeline is how each of these different immune therapies are targeting different aspects of the immune system and each represent a milestone forward in understanding the disease and ways that we can intervene to stop or slow down the immune attack. So now the breakthrough in disease prevention. So when the investigators of teplizumab um, decided uh, that those people who were diagnosed with type 1 diabetes already um, and so they had seen the success of teplizumab in those who'd been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes already, they decided to see if teplizumab would be successful in people prior to the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes at an earlier stage of the disease. And so they took the drug and trialled it in people who had two or more antibodies and had evidence of abnormal glucose tolerance, but not yet diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So if you like, people who we knew were going to get full-blown symptoms, but still had a good amount of beta cells remaining. Now, what is teplizumab? Well, to put it simply, it is an order, sorry, it's an antibody that targets a portion of the T cell that is unique to T cells and acts to inactivate and deplete those T cells that are responsible for attacking the beta cells. And to give you a brief understanding of the study, they took 76 individuals, all relatives of people with type 1 diabetes, and all had two or more order antibodies and abnormal glucose tolerance. The majority were under 18 years of age. And they all received 14 days of this teplizumab as an infusion and then were followed up for about two to three years. So it was a randomized placebo controlled blinded study, which just means that they were randomly allocated to either placebo or teplizumab. Placebo was just a dummy infusion and blinded just means that the, the people investigating didn't know who was having what. After one year of the teplizumab infusion, 13 people receiving placebo developed diabetes compared to only three who were receiving the active drug. And by the end of the study, 72% of those who received placebo got clinical diabetes compared to only 43% of those who were taking the teplizumab. This graph can seem a little complex and so I'll just walk you through it. The pink line represents the people who received placebo and the blue line represents those who received the active drug or teplizumab. And so the lower the line goes, it means the more people who were getting type 1 diabetes in that group. And this is across time as represented in months here along the x-axis. And so 50% of the people in the placebo group developed type 1 diabetes at 24 months. And this was compared to 50% of the people in the teplizumab group um, getting type 1 or clinical, developing clinical type 1 diabetes at 48 months. And so this equated to teplizumab achieving a delay in the development of clinical diabetes by two years. And so this is the first immunotherapy to delay the progression to clinical diabetes with just one course of teplizumab 
um, and it delayed the clinical uh, diagnosis by two years. Teplizumab was found to be safe and well tolerated in children and adolescents. And so the main side effects were rash and a temporary drop in total white cells. Uh, and nearly all the participants completed the study, suggesting uh, that it was well tolerated. It also showed us that screening for autoantibodies in relatives of people with type 1 diabetes was able to effectively identify people at high risk of getting type 1 diabetes. And it means that these people are ideal people to receive immune therapy. Now this hit the news all over the globe, including here in Australia. And currently we're waiting to see if the FDA will approve this for clinical use in people prior to their symptoms of type 1 diabetes. Follow-on studies have shown that a portion of those people who are on teplizumab continue to remain free of clinical diabetes. So where are we headed now? Well, teplizumab is only one of the many agents that I've already shown has successfully delayed the loss of beta cells in people with type 1 diabetes. And so plans are afoot to test many of these other immune therapies to see if they too can be used in people prior to clinical diabetes to delay the onset of the symptoms of the disease, rituxan and being one and low-dose ADG being another. Understanding which targets of the immune system can successfully delay the onset of clinical symptoms is critical to unraveling the key drivers of the disease and will bring us closer to complete prevention and cure. Studies looking for additional and more potent ways to block the immune attack are currently being explored. And baricitinib is one of these exciting new studies that is the first in the world to attempt to block the JAK inhibitor pathway, which Professor Thomas will discuss in detail, as it is a culmination of years of work at St. Vincent's Institute. And it's already, to, it's already known to have incredible effects in rheumatoid arthritis, where people who would previously develop these severe deforming disease um, disease of the joints, uh, now with disease modifying treatment like baricitinib, can retain function and structure of their joints. And it will provide another critical piece in the puzzle of understanding type 1 diabetes and achieving meaningful life-changing therapies. Another effort in Australia is helping those who have a family member with type 1 diabetes to be tested for autoantibodies. This allows early detection of preclinical disease, which not only has the potential to prevent a critical emergency and admission to hospital, um, it also is helpful in identifying people who would best benefit from future immune therapy trials. And so together, these efforts will hopefully, in the not too distant future, and I truly believe we are closer than we've ever been before, um, mean that that conversation we have at the start of you or your child has type 1 diabetes will be followed up with, but we still have time to preserve the beta cells. Here's what we're going to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Michelle. That's very, uh, very enlightening and also very uplifting. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, thank you also to our participants who are asking, asking questions. Look, we're going to answer the questions at the end of the session uh, when we have Helen together with, with Michelle. So please keep asking the questions and um, uh, I'm sure you have plenty along the way. So thank you, Michelle. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Helen Thomas, Professor Helen Thomas to you, who I'm sure many of you uh, would know very well. Um, Professor Helen Thomas is head of, of the Immunology and Diabetes Unit at SVI, which is Australia's largest type one diabetes research group doing amazing work over many, many years. Her research aims to protect the insulin producing beta cells in the pancreas from being destroyed by immune cells. Over to you, Helen. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Karen, for that introduction. And I will share my screen now too. Oops. Okay. I'm hoping everyone can see my slides. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, as Karen said, I'm Helen Thomas. I'm the head of the Immunology and Diabetes Group at SVI, which is a large group of about 30 researchers, and we're all focused on prevention and cure of type 1 diabetes. Um, so we study the disease mechanisms in cells and tissues that we take from people who have type 1 diabetes in their families. And we also use a mouse model of type 1 diabetes that's quite similar to the human disease. 
Uh, and then we test these uh, as potential targets for um, both prevention and cure of type 1 diabetes or as biomarkers of the disease. Um, so our discoveries have led to a clinical trial for type 1 diabetes at SVI um, that we're currently running. And I'm going to tell you about the research that led to this trial. Oops. Uh, okay, so Michelle has told you about the T cells that kill the insulin producing cells in the pancreas. Um, and we and others have been able to see these in thin sections from organ donors with type 1 diabetes, which is shown in these two photos here. So we can see um, this is the insulin in um, the pancreas of a non-diabetic um, pancreas, and we can see nice, healthy beta cells here. In the pancreas from someone who had type 1 diabetes, we can see a reduction in the number of insulin producing cells here, uh, and also an, a lot of these T cells around the islet. So even though we can see the T cells surrounding the beta cells in the islet, what we wanted to do was to see these T cells directly interacting with and killing the beta cells. So we did some time-lapse microscopy, microscopy um, and we mixed some beta cells together with T cells. We labelled the T cells with a green dye that um, makes them flash green when they interact directly with the beta cell. And we also added a red dye that um, makes the beta cell go red when the T cell has killed it. So I'll just show you my movie. So we can see the green dot flash um, when the T cell interacts with the beta cell, which is this cell here in the middle. Uh, and then the beta cell goes red when it takes up the red dye after it's died. So this movie captures the events that are happening in the pancreas in someone who is um, currently developing type 1 diabetes. So we then looked for ways to prevent these T cells from being able to interact with the insulin producing cells. And we turned to our research uh, of the past 25 years that showed that if we block a group of molecules called cytokines, and these are made by the T cells, um, then we could stop this interaction. Um, and so this could be done with a relatively new class of drug called JAK inhibitors. And these um, have been developed by pharmaceutical companies and we're already in clinical trials for other diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. So we tested JAK inhibitors in our time-lapse microscopy movies. So um, on the left here, we have the placebo. Um, again, this is the uh, beta cell in the middle, and we can see the bright green flash with the T cell interacting directly with the beta cell. But when we added our JAK inhibitor um, to the um, to the microscopy, to the cells, we can see that there's not really so much of a green flash uh, this one here um, tries to connect with the beta cell, but it doesn't connect for very long and it's not really able to kill the beta cell. Um, and then when we gave these JAK inhibitors to mice, we were able to significantly protect the mice from developing diabetes. So based on this exciting preclinical data, our lab is now doing a clinical trial to test one JAK inhibitor called baricitinib in people who've just been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So the trial is led by Tom Kay here at SVI and managed by Michaela Wable, the lead, and the lead clinician is John Wentworth at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And the trial is funded by the JDRF, who've supported much of this work through its development. Um, so although Bandit is hoping to reverse new onset type 1 diabetes, there are approximately 140,000 Australians who already have type 1 diabetes. Um, <clears throat> so transplantation to replace the insulin producing cells offers the hope of cure in these individuals. Now, currently our lab is using islets that have been isolated from deceased organ donors to transplant into people who have type one diabetes. And in the, in the future, we hope to use this program um, as a platform to replace insulin production with stem cell derived insulin producing cells. Um, and occasionally through our transplant program, we are very lucky to receive a donated pancreas from someone who had type 1 diabetes. So from these pancreases, we are able to isolate the islets and culture them in growth factors that keep the T cells happy. And this picture here shows an islet that's surrounded by T cells that have been um, cultured out of the um, pancreas of someone who had type 1 diabetes. So Stuart Mannering, who's shown in this picture here, um, worked out what proteins in the beta cells these T cells are able to recognize. 
And then Michelle, during her PhD, tested for similar T cells in the blood of people who had type 1 diabetes and found that 60% of people with type 1 diabetes have these same cells compared to only one person in the non-diabetic individuals. Um, so these T cells are great targets for future type 1 diabetes therapy, but they're also really good biomarkers of type 1 diabetes because they can be easily detected in the blood. And so through our research, we are hoping to make a difference to the way type 1 diabetes is treated. Our BANDIT trial and biomarker development are currently being tested in people after clinical diagnosis with stage 3, and we're using transplantation to replace the insulin-producing cells much later after di diagnosis. But ideally what we want to do is develop therapies that will prevent type 1 diabetes in individuals at risk of developing disease, which is on the left of this diagram. And that's where much of our future re research will be focused. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much, Helen. Um, it's very, very exciting. Uh, now, we have um, a lot of questions that uh, for Michelle and Helen. So I'm, um, I'm going to start reading them out, but I would encourage uh, everyone, if you have questions, to please um, ask them. So we have at the moment around 10 questions just to allow you to, in terms of your time in answering them. So perhaps if we can start off with um, one probably for Michelle or maybe Helen, um, it's about familial links and risks. So you said in your presentation, 15 times risk if uh, familiar, a familial link. It seems to be quite disconcerting to the person asking the question. What is the non-familial risk to put this into context? Yeah, that's a really uh, insightful question. So the background risk, and it does depend on um, your heritage. So the race, um, we know that European, particularly Scandinavian countries, um, America and um, parts of Australia are, um, higher, have higher risk, background risk. Um, but if you take a European um, descent background, uh, we would usually quote about 0.3%. Uh, so 15 times increase is about you know, three, four percent um, in that person. And it also depends on which family member and things. Uh, and so it's not huge, um, I guess, at the end of the, uh, after you've sort of times it by 15, but it's enough for us to be able to identify, um, use family history to identify people at higher risk through antibody testing and things and to provide clinical trials to those people. And often family history is uh, the route um, by which we identify those um, at-risk individuals for prevention trials. Uh, well, that leads on to perhaps another question. At what age is it best to have my child tested for the antibodies? Uh, husband is type, has type 1 diabetes and the child is almost 1. Yeah, also a great question. Um, so we don't typically test antibodies before the age of 1. Um, Around between sort of zero and six months, it's not so much a, the case in your situation, but um, if the mother had type 1 diabetes, for example, their antibodies can transfer through to the, um, through the bloodstream, to the placenta, um, and so it will look like the baby has antibodies even though they don't, uh, and so it can cause misdiagnoses. And also we know for type 1 diabetes in those longitudinal studies, typically those antibodies don't develop anyway till sort of two, three years of age. Um, so at the moment, the screening program here in Australia starts at the age of two. Uh, so that's when I would wait for. Uh, our 13 year old granddaughter was diagnosed last year with type one diabetes. Mm. Can her 11 year old sister be tested? And incidentally, both girls have celiac disease. Yeah, exactly. That, that's um, uh, your, the, the sister or your other daughter um, is the prime person to um, get tested for antibodies. Um, celiac disease, we know. So there's something called HLA, uh, which is sort of like a genetic signature that uh, each person has from their mother and their father. And there are particular HLA types that predispose you to particular autoimmune diseases. Um, it's the way that the immune system presents different proteins to, us, um, to the other parts of the immune system. Uh, and so uh, Celiac disease um, has certain risk HLA types that coincide with type 1 diabetes. And so uh, definitely um, your 
11 year old daughter oh sorry granddaughter uh, would be um, ideal person to get tested and I would just go through you could go through that website that I put up before um, www.typeonscreen.org uh, and um, follow the links thank you Michelle now this is a, a from a lot of these questions are anonymous so I can't tell you but I'm ans I'm asking them as if you know, I'm speaking, uh, I'm just reading them straight out. So is there any hope for those of us who were diagnosed as a 17 year old in 1978? We are now entering our twilight years. Well, not necessarily, but anyway, and even though living well with insulin dependent diabetes, I'm sure we could cope without it. So any hope? I don't know, um, Helen, would you like to ask this <laughs> yeah. one? I do want to, do you want me to take that one, Michelle? <laughs> you can start it off and, and then I can sure. add, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I guess you saw from um, from my presentation that the lab is doing transplantation to replace the insulin producing cells in people that have type one diabetes. Um, it's not available to everyone who has type one diabetes because there's a great shortage of um, of the number of organ donors in Australia is very low compared to the number of people with type one diabetes. And plus, it's quite difficult to purify enough islets from one pancreas to um, transplant into someone and, and um, make them insulin independent. Um, and so really the transplantation at the moment is only available to people who have severe hypoglycemia unawareness. Um, but having said that, you know, there is hope in the future that we'll be able to generate enough beta cells using stem cell therapy to transplant into everyone who has diabetes. Michelle, have you got just, anything to add to that? Or? Yeah, I was just going to say um, being diagnosed at 17 uh, means that you were a little bit older when you were diagnosed. Perhaps your, um, the rate of your immune attack might be a little bit slower. And we're learning more and more how heterogeneous this disease is. So some people can have uh, residual beta cell function quite late in the disease. And my hope is in the future, and uh, obviously the government bodies and things you know they are focusing on prevention of people before they get symptoms but my hope is that one day there will be um, available immune therapies for people even later on in the disease to preserve what they do have because we do know that even a small portion um, of beta cell function has a lot of benefit even just from the day-to-day -day management of type 1 diabetes so that's that's my hope and uh, hopefully we will get there. Well, I think that you've sort of answered the next question, which was um, from Jane saying, what happens to those who've had the disease for longer and are past the benefits of the drugs aiming at pre-detection? So I think that question's been answered. You'd agree with that? Uh, so another question about beta cells. Um, do beta cells regenerate only to be killed off by T cells or do we have a limited number that can never regenerate? Uh, if the former... Uh, does the body just give up regenerating beta cells after a period of time? I don't know who would like to answer that. Helen? I'm happy to do that one. Um, so we are born with a fixed number of beta cells and they're not able to regenerate, which is why, um, uh, why once they're all lost in type 1 diabetes, then um, you have to take insulin for the rest of your life. Um, we are able to replace the beta cells with transplantation, as I said, and one of the issues with that is that the immune system can still remember that it wants to attack the beta cells. And so the beta cells that we uh, replace can be attacked by the immune system in the same way that the original beta cells can be attacked. Um, yeah, so the, the body doesn't give up on regenerating beta cells. It's just not capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, now there's an a offer um, of help from Jenny. <laughs> We have a family history of type one through a number of generations. Are you in need of blood donations in your research from family members who have type one and from those who don't have type one from families? Is there any way we can help? Wow, that is uh, incredibly generous of you, Jenny. And we are definitely open to um, uh, involving people who are interested in being involved in type one diabetes research uh, for for family members of people who have type 1 diabetes, we would start off with just screening for antibodies. Um, and that that's one uh, pathway to be able to um, be involved in studies. So depending on antibody positivity and things. Uh, so we would 
I would typically say just start from that. So uh, lo log on to the website again, www.type1screen.org, uh, and then start off with uh, just screening for antibodies. Yes, and there's a, another um, question about how, how you could be part of these trials. So if you'd just like to recap on that for everyone listening. Yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, yep. Yeah. Helen, you go. No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess Michelle's already told us about the type one screen, but if you want to be involved in the bandit trial, if you're, um, if, if uh, you or your child is between the ages of 10 and 30 and diagnosed in the last hundred days, so in the last three months, um, then you might be eligible and you can find the information about bandit on the SVI website. Um, and if you can't find it there, then I'm sure that um, either Michelle or I can help you or even Karen or someone from SVI can help you find the information. Absolutely. Now, there's a, another fascinating question, which I'd really like the answer to as well. It's um, uh, the diabetes establishment has focused on the role of the pancreas and liver in insulin and glucagon. Can you tell us a, a little bit about incretins and incretin based therapies? Now, I always thought incretin was a gut hormone. Is that, is, can you explain? Who'd like to take that <laughs> fantastic question? <laughs> start oh, explaining start. about this, <laughs> the role of incretin. Yeah, so um, that's right. Incretin, they are gut hormones. And um, there's a lot of research that, and maybe I'm not going to give the exact, I'm not going to give it, I'm going to give a scientific answer, not a cl clinical answer. So Michelle can give you a, a clinical perspective. But um, there's been a lot of research suggesting that these hormones um, improve the survival of beta cells and their function and, and improves their function. And so um, there, uh, there's, a, there's a, been a lot of research suggesting that if you, um, if you give these, um, these um, uh, agonists of these hormones, as, yeah, agonists, then, then you can, um, in combination with an immune therapy, then you can not only um, dampen the immune system, but you can also increase the functional survival of the beta cell. So you're sort of affecting both at the same time which is something also that we found with our um, baricitinib is that baricitinib is also able to improve the survival of the beta cell as well as dampen the immune system. Michelle, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, that was um, what I was thinking about. The, there was a recent study uh, looking at one of the incretin hormones with an immune therapy and suggestive that the combination was better than uh, each one separately. Uh, we haven't seen um, any convincing data yet uh, that these GLP-1 agonists or incretin hormones can actually um, prevent on their own uh, decline of the beta cells. But there have also been uh, studies showing that a lot of uh, people already diagnosed with type 1 diabetes can smooth out their glucose control uh, with the uh, incretin hormone-based drugs. Uh, which is unfortunately not subsidised by the government yet, but um, something else that unrelated to beta cell uh, protection, but good for quality of life. Thank you. Well, we have one last question. Um, it's from a very generous organ donor. So I'm an organ donor with type 1. Can I be confident my pancreas will actually get to the researchers? I think that I, I think I can say yes to that question. Um, if your family know that you want to donate your um, pancreas to research, then um, they will be asked if you want to become an organ donor and um, they will consent to, to having research um, done on your pancreas and that pancreas will go to our lab because we're the only lab in Australia that accepts pancreases that had type 1 from people who had type 1 diabetes. Uh, I've just seen a, a last question and it's to me. So this is about, um, has any thought, and I might ask you, your advice as well, but has any thought been given to educating the public about the difference between type one and type two? Look, it's uh, because, you know, and I think it's a really important point because so many people, and I think you addressed this in the beginning of your presentation, Michelle, uh, so many people just think of diabetes as one thing. And uh, it used to be categorised in the olden days, maturity onset diabetes and juvenile onset diabetes. But uh, I don't think people understand the difference between type one and type two. And um, 
I think there does need to be some uh, education ab about that because they're vastly different, and uh, yet they they seem to people seem to just talk about diabetes as diabetes, and I believe there's diabetes three now too, which is uh, talked about. So, uh, w w anything in your fields, like from uh, the medical side or from the scientific side, in terms of public education? Um, I'm not sure. Um... <laughs> because we look at the organisations like the Diabetes Australia and, and all of these uh, public health organisations and, and there is some education there, but it, it's, it's not enough. So I think we'll mm. take that on notice, a very good suggestion, mm. uh, because I think, you know, we've all fallen into that trap of, of perhaps just talking about diabetes and um, I think it, it does need to be differentiated. So a very, very good point. Yeah. Well. What can I say, but thank you very much to um, to Dr. Michelle So and Professor Helen Thomas for your um, very excellent presentations, very uplifting, very positive. It's so exciting. I'm surprised nobody asked you a timeline. When will we have this cure? <laughs> but um, I know it's as soon as possible. But I'd really like to thank the um, audience today because you've been very um, active and interested and you've asked some phenomenal questions. So thank you very much for that. And also thank you very much uh, for your support uh, of SVI and um and our programs. And there's certainly an opportunity if you'd like to support the research that we're doing in terms of uh, diabetes because um, we always we always need your money <laughs> and your gifts as well as your support. So please feel free to contact our foundation or even get onto the SBI website and make a donation if you feel that you've uh, you'd like to support uh, Michelle and Helen with their research. So um, thank you very much for attending and watching this uh, webinar. We'll be sending out a recording in the next couple of days. So if you'd like to pass on these presentations to other members of your family or some of your friends or people you know who are interested in type 1 diabetes, uh, feel free to do that. And um, we'll be also sending out a, a survey just to, we, you know, just to get your feedback on how we can improve uh, these virtual events. Uh, so we really would appreciate uh, you taking a few minutes to actually uh, fill them out. So if you'd like to learn anything more about what we do at SVI, uh, please just uh, contact us uh, at the foundation office. Uh, we have a new CEO now, David Drysdale, that you could contact or our major gifts, Simone Flanagan, or of course, uh, Nicola Penigal, um, who is has organised this event. So thank you very much. And we look forward to you joining us at our next um, seminar, which will a Health Matters webinar, which will be held in November later on. So thank you once again to our speakers and thank you to our audience uh, for everything you do for SVI. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.